Um, this is our 11-15 session, and we will be doing the overview of WIM syndrome. I'm Jenna McFadden. I'm the program manager of support services at IDF. I do our Get Connected group and peer support programs. We do have 45 minutes allotted for this session, and we will have a brief Q&A at the end if time permits. I want to take a moment to say thank you to our sponsors. This session is sponsored by X4 Pharmaceuticals. And then we're going to go through a quick disclaimer that's posted right here. The information uh, presented during this session is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice. Always seek the advice of your physician about your personal condition. And the Immune Deficiency Foundation educational events, we offer a wide array of presentations, including content developed by healthcare and life management professionals. Um, the views and opinions expressed by guest speakers do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of IDF. Now, I have the opportunity to introduce our presenter, Dr. Hartog. Dr. Hartog is an allergist and clinical immunologist at Helen DeVos. Children's Hospital, Corwell Health, and Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. He is head of pediatric and adult primary immune deficiency clinic at his institution. He is also active in the Clinical Immunology Society, currently serving on their education and advocacy, advocacy committees. In addition, he has an active research project in immune deficiency and RNA sequencing and immuno immunologic conditions. So, if you guys can give a round of applause to Dr. Hartog, please. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks everyone for being here. All right, so that's the start. And so, um, right from the start, um, I, we're going to talk about WIM, obviously, here and, and go through it a lot. I am really laid back in my presenting style, and so. There's going to be time for questions at the end. I'll be up here for questions too, but also um, if questions come up during it. Feel free to raise your hand. It's fine. I, I I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm pretty laid back, like I said. So I'm going to start out and just I'm going to talk to you throughout this about what whim means to me and what as a medical professional what it means and as a um, somebody running um, an immune deficiency clinic if somebody comes on in. But what I say WIM means to me, it's different from each and every one of you who are living through WIM um, and what that means to you. Some of these things you're going to nod your head and say, yep, that's, I've lived that life. Some of you are not going to experience. And you, some of these things you'll know, honestly, way better than me because you've experienced them either personally or, or with your family, too. And so just thinking um, and comparing your experiences to, to, to what mine are and thinking about that as we kind of go through that talk. So with that, what does WIM mean to me? It means warts, it means hypogammaglobulinemia, it means immune deficiency, and it means myelocathexis. Uh, don't worry, we're going to go into way more detail about what all of these long word mean, uh, but WIM is just the easier way to say it. Um, I'm going to go through each and every one of those, actually not in order, I kind of I rearranged the letters to make, it, uh, make the story make a little bit more sense. But we'll, we'll go into a lot more detail about each one of these manifestations, how they can present. They don't present in everyone, and how we can have some treatments for it and how we move forward with it. All right. So when I talk to anybody about a disease, and especially patients too, I like to start by talking, and I'd like people to understand, well, what's the mechanism of the disease? How does this disease happen? Because I'm always shocked at when I see patients who have been diagnosed before, they've been told they have this disease, but no one's ever sat down and told them, well, why does this happen? And they don't completely understand their disease and how they get there. And so we'll go through this. This is super complicated. Don't worry. There's not, not, not going to be any tests on this, and we'll make it make sense um, with you. So when we start out, we see at the CXCR4 at the top. That's the thing that we're talking about. It's what we call a G protein coupler receptor. And so the line, this is the cell surface. And so if we think of any cell in your body as like a balloon, this is the, the, the latex or what's making up the balloon. And it's a um, receptor, and so it's a signal. So if we think of like a dominoes, so something's going to come along, we'll say CXCL12 in this time. It's gonna start the dominoes. Those dominoes are gonna go through the balloon, 
and then it's going to make things happen. And, and that's what this is signaling. And so something comes along, the CXCL12 docks on the CXCL4. Then it makes things happen. What does it make happen? Well, we start on the bottom left. Survival. So it helps these cells survive. And then proliferation. So what, what I mean by proliferation is they're making more of themselves. So you start out with one balloon, all of a sudden we have, they split and we all of a sudden we have four balloons, eight balloons, that, all that. So that's what proliferation means. Chemotaxis. Chemotaxis is a little bit of a weird thing. And so what it is is the cells will sense things and they'll sense things outside the cell and they'll move in that, that direction. And, and so that's what the chemotaxis is. And so you need the CXCR4 to do that. Migration. Um, and this is migration. So you have cells in your blood. Um, if you fall down, scrape your knee, um, what happens is a lot of immune cells are going to come in to try to fight that infection there. So they come from the blood into the tissue. That's migrating into the tissue. So they're moving from where they are. And um, let's talk about proliferation. Um, endocytosis. So this is an, an important one. And this will be very key to the disease. So your body doesn't do everything and doesn't have all receptors on the cell that started these dominoes at all times. Sometimes it takes away some of the dominoes so the pathway will stop. So, so things, it's how it regulates itself. So this endocytosis is the process of your body taking this receptor off the cell surface so then if the CXCL12 comes in, there, there's nothing for it to, to signal there in white. So it's the process of taking away the receptor, which you'll see in WIM, that's um, a key thing that really drives a lot of um, what's going on. And then when we talk about this receptor, it's not everywhere in your body. And, and so every, like I said, again, the dominoes, um, the start of those, they're not in every cell in your body. They're not in your skin, for if we say the CXCR4, because your skin's going to be different than your blood. And so these are mainly on your immune cells, specifically your leukocytes. These are one of your white blood cells in your body. And the, these are the cells in your body that drive a lot of um, your immune system. All right. So this is a different way of looking over kind of the same thing. And I included it just to go over really to drive this in. And so again, we see the outside of the balloon. We see this um, receptor, and it goes back and forth through the balloon. It goes back and forth actually seven times. That's what makes it a G protein coupled receptor. So if you ever get that in trivia, seven times. Um, and um, then we see, again, it signals, again, all of these various processes that end up in proliferation, making more of itself survival so they don't die, um, and this chemotaxis and migration, so the process of moving, and then the process of moving through tissue. Um, and then the last one that we really didn't touch on the last slide was gene transcription. And so what this means is you get this signal, it goes through, and then it goes to your DNA and says, hey, we need to um, activate this part of your body and activate a new process. And so this is a, the, the part that, that makes new proteins and, and makes a new process go on. All right. So with WIM, it's a problem in the CXCR4. That's why we're talking about it. That's why I'm going on about this. And specifically, it's what we call a gain of function. A lot of time in immune deficiency, there's a loss of function. So we just take away something. This is a gain of function. What I mean by this is it's the simple way to think about it is driving a car. So this is, instead of having a brake and a gas, all of a sudden we take away the brake and we just slam on the gas pedal. And that's what's going on here. And so it's just as you just continue to go and continue to go. Um, and, and so that's how, how to think of a gain of function. It's doing... It's got its job, it's doing its job, it's just doing way, it way too much. Um, and when we look at this, um, what all this fancy thing is at the end, is this is documenting all of the various um, mutations um, in the gene and in the protein that have been shown to cause WIM. And if you notice, one of the things too, is they're all what we call the C-terminal intracellular domain. What that means for you is it's inside the balloon. And, and, and so these are, these, all these mutations are inside the balloon. And, and we use that when we're thinking about, um, well, like looking at genetic tests and saying, could this be WIM and all of that? Is that they really should be in, in this part of the protein if, if it's WIM? And you can see really a lot of parts of the, the part inside the balloon have been documented to show there. So if we look a little bit closer at this, on the left-hand side, we've again got this CXCR4, and that WT, what that means is wild type. Um, and when 
a protein is normal and not mutated, we call it wild type. So all the, body, the, the proteins in your body are wild type. Um, versus the CXCR4 WIM, that means it's got a mutation that's causing it to be overactive. So when we say CXCR4 under homeostasis, that means it's regulated. And so it's got its proper regulation. It's not doing too much, too little. It's doing the Goldilocks principle. It's doing just enough. So what it does is after it gets to CXCL2 and it does its job is it starts to internalize and then it degrades. And so it degrades, breaks apart that protein. It's done its job. Your body then um, breaks it apart so it doesn't do its job again. And, and then it leads to the chemotaxis. It leads to all the jobs that it does. However, in WIM, we have prolonged interaction with the CXCL2 and the CXCR4. And then number two, it doesn't internalize. It doesn't degrade. It keeps doing what it's, what, um, and it keeps signaling, signaling, signaling. And then one of the things that's broken is this chemotaxis. And so moving out of the bone marrow, and well, there's another picture. And we'll talk about the, this in a lot more detail. And that's where we end up with this myelocathexis. Don't worry about that. what that means right now. We'll, we'll talk about what myelocathexis means in a few slides here. But this is the, the problem is it just stays on the, on the surface of the balloon and just keeps going. So with that background, this is how we get there. So starting with the eye, as I told you, I'm going to go through in a different order. Uh, but this is the immune deficiency. So what we mean in immune deficiency is there's a defect in the immune system that helps fight off infections that makes people with WIMS susceptible to certain infections. I say certain infections because in any immune deficiency we deal with, it's not that there's zero immune system. It's that you have very specific problems in very specific areas that make you susceptible to things. Uh, some of those are very serious things, absolutely. And so when we think about these specific infections in WIM, we have one, lymphopenia, and these are one of your white blood cells. Penia means low. So we have low white blood cells. That leads to the hypogammaglobulinemia. That's the H, um, and we'll talk about that next. Um, then we also have the neutropenia. Neutropenia, the infections that we are susceptible for there are bacteria and sepsis, so um, bacteria in your blood can make you very sick. Skin abscesses um, can happen, and so skin infections. Oral infections, this is super common, and so um, oral infections, needing teeth pulled, ulcers in your mouth, all of these are associated with neutropenia. And then perirectal and genital um, infections, there's not many immune deficiencies that cause that. It, all of them are really surrounded around low neutrophils. Um, there. And then we also have another white blood cell called monocytes. These are often typically low, too. Right. So when we talk about the hypogammaglobulinemia, and so what this means is low IgG. It's a long word to say low IgG, and this is a specific protein in your body. And when we have problems of it, we have sinus, ear, and lung infections. Those are very classic. Those are the three we get. And then we can have end organ damage from these recurrent infections. We can have hearing loss um, from that. We can have scarring in the lungs. We'll talk a little bit later. And um, it's not just that each individual infection can be serious. It's the accumulation over time, too. And when we think about um, the, the hypogammaglobin anemia, the most common disease that we see with it is CVID, or common variable immune deficiency. And people with WIM have that presentation. And when I look at IgG and think about what it does, I think about if that's a bacteria um, right there, we have B cells, and then we have a T cell come in. And then those two interact, um, and then that helps make an antibody. So this is what we'll call the IgG this time. And then these specific ends of the IgG right there, the, the heavy chain, um, are going to be specific for the bacteria. They're going to coat the bacteria. And then we have different cells, phagocytes, we have NK cells, all of those come in, recognize the IgG, they kill the bacteria. This is how things should happen um, in your immune system. However, if we have a problem where those ends don't recognize the, the bacteria, your B cells just don't make IgG, or we can also have problems where the B and the T cells don't talk um, properly, then uh, these come in. And there's nothing on the bacteria. The phagocyte and NK cells don't know what to do. They don't get any signals. So they just keep hanging out. They don't kill the bacteria. Then what, uh, what happens is the bacteria wants to make more of itself. That's all it wants to do in its life. So it does. And then we get infections. We get the sinus, ear, and lung infections um, with this. And this, in essence, is, is what happens when we have a problem with the IgG. 
Now, when we look at the IgG a little bit closer, the, the way I think about it is we, um, there's two ways we look at it. We number, do you have enough, and function, does it work? And most people have a normal number, normal function. They're, they're going to work just fine. Um, but then there's some people with a normal number, but it doesn't work very well. And then there's people with a little bit low number, which I see all the time, but it works just fine. And these are people I reassure in my clinic all the time because they're, they're not getting infections and, and they have a little bit low number, but everything works just fine. But then we have people with a low number, low function. These typically fall into that CVID category and they tend to have lots of infections. So you'll see, regardless of the number, it's really the function, um, and does it work, does it respond to the bacteria is what matters the most. And, and the various ways we can test this, but one of the ways which a lot of you may have experienced is um, giving a, a vaccine called the pneumococcal 23, the pneumonia vaccine, and that's often um, a test that we use to be able to say, do you need um, treatment for this or not? And we'll, we'll talk about the treatment at the end. We'll just leave it at that for now. And then um, the W in WIM is warmth. Um, and usually this is mainly due to human papillomavirus um, or HPV. Um, and we can have various skin rashes too that have HPV that are not warts in WIM too. So just a, a really big susceptibility to HPV. And there's tons and tons of HPV um, virus types that live in this world, um, actually over about 250, and all of those can be a problem in, in patients with women. And it, as you notice this, and again, um, maybe something that a lot of you have experienced is this isn't somebody who has just like one or two warts needs to be burned off by a dermatologist, you're fine. This is a really extensive warts, and this is not uncommon. And when we think of immune deficiency, there's not a whole ton of immune deficiencies that have problem with warts like this. It's a, it's a very small list. And so when, when I see something like this, my list of things that can cause, that can cause these problems gets pretty small um, when we're trying to figure out a diagnosis um, here. All right. Then the, the last part of it is the, the myelocathexis. Um, and I don't expect uh, many of you to be um, pathologists here um, and, and recognizing it. But if you see, so all of these are cells, so like I said, those balloons. And if you see, um, let's see, do I have a pointer? Yep, so like right here, this is a neutrophil. And how I know this is a neutrophil is there's the nucleus, and the nucleus in the cell is what has all of your DNA, all your information. And so this nucleus right here is what we call multi-lobed, and so you see that there's like three lobes to it versus um, let's see, like this one is going to be a lymphocyte, so a B cell, a T cell, and I can tell that because the nucleus takes up, is kind of smooth, and it takes up most of the cell. So this is, all of the ones like this are neutrophils. If you start looking around, there's lots of neutrophils in here. There's lots that look like this, and, and you know, to, to cut to the chase, there's way too many. They're not, they should make themselves, and then they should escape um, to your blood. They shouldn't just be sitting around in your bone marrow. Them sitting around in your bone marrow, that's myelocathexis. And so it just means neutrophils not leaving. Um, and that, in essence, is, is what we mean by myelocathexis. All right. Well, how do we get there? How do we get to that myelocathexis? So again, we have the bone marrow. And actually, at the top here, so we have the bone marrow. And then this is your, your capillary, so your blood. And so this is escaping from your bone marrow into your blood. And we have the normal CXCR4 signaling. And um, the cells are going to recognize what they call a chemokine gradient. And so they recognize um, they have this high CXCL12, and they want to go to the low. And so they, because of this CXCL12 that's floating around, they leave where it's high and, and get out of the bone marrow. And you see that everything, and this is what's supposed to happen, because we really want these cells in your blood. The bone marrow just makes it. They're not supposed to hang out there for forever. They're just supposed to make the cells escape to the blood so they can do their job. I'm sorry, this slide I forgot to format a little differently, so ignore the, the title at the top. But um, what we have here then at the bottom is on the left-hand side, we have the wild type. So again, the normal signaling versus the signaling in the WIM side. And if we compare this, this is, a, I think, a really nice picture that really if you compare the bottom left to the top right, we see that myelocathexis. And so the top right is the myelocathexis, so the cells are just hanging out there. And the reason that they are hanging out is they're unable to recognize that CXCL12, that the gradient, and so that there's 
too much in one area, not enough in another. They're unable. They just don't get that signal. That dominoes. There's nothing there to start that 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 dominoes to really make that happen. Um, and then these neutrophils continue to mature in the bone marrow. That's not where they're supposed to mature. And eventually they start with apoptosis. They die. Um, and, and so they they continue to to make more of themselves. Then they die. And if they do their whole lifespan in the bone marrow. That's, they didn't do anything. They didn't do any part of what they're supposed to do in life. And um, what that ends up leading to is decreased circulating neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes. So these white blood cells, they don't escape to the blood. And this we can actually test, and this is very classic, is we have low neutrophils, low monocytes, low lymphocytes in the blood, and we can test that. And so that's a common pattern that we can see in WIM. And one of the things that should make us think, could this be WIM, when we have a patient who comes into us? Yeah, and so all this contributes to the immune deficiency. All right. So other things um, that, that can happen with them. There's, um, when we focus, and I, I think the most important, important part of the body is the immune system, but I guess there's other parts of the body too that we should care about. And um, one of them is the heart in WIM. Is, is, so they can have something called the tetralogy or flow, which is a, a, a fairly serious, um, usually heart defect that needs surgery um, early on in life. And so this um, is usually honestly recognized right away um, by, by pediatricians and um, surgery happens to correct this fairly early on. And the surgery's gotten much better recently than it, than it once was. And, and so you can see a few different defects. So there's a hole in the middle of the heart. There's a narrow area on the pulmonary artery. There's a thick wall. Um, and, and all of that just needs to be corrected. And there's, there's a, a bunch of different things that can cause tetralogy of flow. It's by no means just in WIM, um, not even close. But it is one of the things that can be seen in WIM. Not everybody, but it, but it can be seen. One of the things I talked about, too, was the, the long-term complications um, from recurrent infections. And so this is some simple things. So one is endorgan organ damage from bronchiectasis. This is scarring in the lungs. So one of the reasons we treat to, to prevent pneumonias is to prevent death, prevent the pneumonias, but also to prevent continued infections to get scarring and long-term damage. Um, cancer risk, um, and so in, in WIM, there is a lymphoma risk. Uh, we don't know quite how high it is, but it is quite a bit elevated from the um, general population. Um, and what I do to my patients who have that elevated lymphoma risk, um, there's no specific screening, um, but rather than I do a good lymph node exam, so I'm feeling their neck, their armpits, um, groin every time, also asking um, questions, uh, your weight loss, we have night sweats, things like that that can trip us off a little bit. We get blood counts on a regular basis too. Um, and I tell patients that have the lymphoma risk, it's probably reasonable to feel your lymph nodes once a month, once every two or three months. Nothing obsessive, but just every once in a while knowing that. And that's really the best screening we have because there's no clear one. Um, HPV, there is a, um, anytime we get Again, the, the wart virus, there is an elevated risk for what we call squamous cell cancer, and so that is um, a skin cancer um, associated with it. So that's something we want to know and, and, and to be aware of um, also. All right. So this is a good, um, how it, what we um, say a pedigree, and so we're thinking about how does this inherit it. So WIM, um, as, we, as I kind of said, it's a CXCR4 problem, but this is an inherited problem. And so it, it can either, sometimes it starts with the first patient, oftentimes it's inherited, and sometimes we don't know about it. So if we pretend that, say, um, this patient three walks into my clinic, and this is going to be the first patient we document with WIM. Um, so this is a disease that you just need. You get one gene from your mom, one from your dad, they come together. Um, you just need one bad gene in order to have the disease. There's some genes you need two bad, so one from mom, one from dad. Uh, but in WIM, you just need one bad one. And so we see, we make this diagnosis in three, and our first job is to take care of patient three. But then also another job we have is saying, in these what we call autosomal dominant conditions, is to say who else in the family might have this, and who else could we be missing? And you can see in this, this situation, oh, well, mom has it, and the circles are females, squares are males, um, sister has it, and then we know that each of them has kids, and we need to screen. And so you can see all of a sudden that if patient three comes into my clinic, suddenly we can have five more patients with this disease, and they may have different manifestations and different severities too, and that can be one of the tricky things, is they don't all look the same um, unless we look, and, and then we look and we find them. Uh, and so this is one of, one of the things here. All right. 
So when we talk a, a little bit more about treatment, there's a few different ways to think about it. Um, and first, the warts. So the HPV vaccine is something that comes up, and it's a recommended vaccine at age 10 or 11, right around there. And the, it's in the general population is recommended. Um, it covers only nine high-risk types of HPV. They're high-risk because they're high-risk for causing cancer, um, the squamous cell cancer we talked about. However, there's over 250 known types of HPV, and so it does not even come close to covering all of them. Right now, it's unknown if the vaccine substantially um, will affect the warts, um, and it's all known, also known unknown if established warts can be helped by the vaccine. So I, I, I don't know. You know, the warts that we have, I'm not sure. It's also unknown if um, it will decrease the cancer risk in women patients. In the, in the general population, absolutely, it decreases the cancer risk, and that's absolutely why we do it. Um, but it does cover the, the ones that are, while I say there's over 250 HPV strains, there, there's nine that are really drive most of the cancer, even in the general population. So there is potential um, in women patients. We don't know for sure. Um, my personal take on it um, is there's no harm. Why not? There is a lot of unknown of what the upside will be. I think there's basically no downside. Um, and, and in a lot of things in rare disease, that's how we have to think about it, is risk-benefit. And we may not know some of the, the firm answers, but sometimes things just make sense. For me, this is one thing that makes sense, is getting the full HPV vaccine series, which for some of us, if you're, say, 50, you would have just missed it because the vaccine only came out a few years ago and you never would have been at the age where it was indicated. Um, wart treatment. Um, I was talking about a little bit of this. I didn't go into a whole ton of detail about the, the individual treatment for warts. Um, and the big reason there is I'm not a dermatologist. Um, but you, you do want a dermatologist who's experienced with this kind of thing because they can be hard to treat um, here. Because we're really, um, they can be hard to treat in general. And, and then we're fighting and then once they're established, your immune system isn't helping out. And so that's part of the problem, is that we're fighting this battle and your immune system isn't supporting it. Um, and so there's lots of different treatments. Amoquinid could be one of them, laser therapy, cryotherapy. Um, and there's a bunch of other therapies dermatologists have, um, sometimes cutting them out. Um, but it can be, it can be difficult um, to treat and frustrating. And then uh, for the myelocathexis, there, there's something called leukocyte mobilizing agents. So in general, most of the recommendations we'll have, if your neutrophil count is below 500, normal is usually about, about 1,500, kind of depends on your age, but about 1,500 is a normal count. Um, and so if it's below 500, we do know that you're at significant risk for some of these infections. And there is something called GCSF, um, and this is an inject injection drug. Typically, it's three times a week, although that can vary um, based on somebody's individual uh, needs. Um, and it really helps to force and push these neutrophils out of the bone marrow. We use this in tons of different diseases, um, lots of cancer treatment. Um, in, in every day, they use the GCSF for that and to help with the, the neutropenia there. Uh, but we can use those treatments from in other aspects of medicine to use to help with patients with WIM. So it increases the neutrophils. Um, it does not increase the lymphocytes or the monocytes. Um, and it also does not improve the warts um, either. And so the wart problem, it's not just the new, or it's not the neutrophils um, as the issue. And, and so basically what all of this shows here is what we end up with is more mature neutrophils out of the bone marrow. And in some patients, this can be something that's needed. Not everyone um, with WIM, but definitely it is uh, an important thing for some of them. All right. We talked earlier about the H, the hypogammaglobinemia, and the IgG replacement therapy. So if your IgG is low and it doesn't work, you're at risk for the, um, the, moan, the ear, sinus, and lung infections. And so what do we do? If it's low and doesn't work, we replace it. So we have replacement we can do. Um, the replacement is a blood product, and so um, it comes from plasma donors. And so anybody who donates plasma, the uh, companies will pool it together and, and then make it so that we can give it to you. And so it's one of, one of those products um, there. A couple different ways we can give it. One is IV, and it's IV, and then the IG is IgG. So the IV, it's they have an IV, they make an IV, it's an infusion. You usually have to do it at an infusion center. Some insurances will allow it at home, um, and it takes about four to six hours. There are some side effects, fatigue, um, body aches, headaches, fever, um, that happen probably 10 to 20% of the patients. 
patients that I have that have those issues, um, tell me it just feels like they're coming down with a cold, and, they come, and then a, a day or two later it'll get better. Although most people tolerate it just fine, but there, there's a, a percentage that we need to, to do, uh, but we have some side effects. And it's every three to four weeks we do it. There's subcutaneous IgG, and so this is just under the skin, and it's a small little needle that goes just under the skin, and uh, that's what a sub-Q. It takes, depending, less than one to two hours, kind of depends on the medicine. Really minimal side effects. Some people occasionally get a little redness at the site, and you can do it daily, which I've got no one who does it daily, um, or up to every two weeks. I think most of my patients will do it every week. Uh, and um, people like this because of the lower side effects, because it's mobile, they can take it with them. Um, they don't have to revolve their schedule, take days off from work, all of that. Um, some people don't like it because they have to do it themselves. Some people don't, you know, don't want to put the needle in and themselves. It's very easy, but some people, they don't like that. So it's not the choice for them. And then there's also something called facilitated sub-Q um, IgG, which is all the advantages of IgG, except there's a two-step infusion to make a little room under your skin so that we can put more volume in. So it's an every three to four week infusion. There's one product that does this and really minimal side effects with this too. Um, really the point of being is that all of these IgG replacement, there's options. Uh, um, and, and I've got lots of patients who choose different options for different reasons. And, and so there's just choices and discussions to be had. Oh, and I should say, um, all of these options um, at the end are the same as far as treatment. And when I counsel my patients on them, I tell them I don't care which one they choose, which one they choose is for them, um, because from the medical side, they're the same. All right, and so when we look and we look at um, cohorts or groups of patients with WIM, we can say, well, what treatment are people getting on average? And so this is from a paper that took a bunch of people with women and just said, what treatment are their doctors giving? And some people, and this is a breakdown, and you can see all sorts of stuff. It really depends, and people are really, the treatment depends on what manifestations or what they present with. You see, some get just the GCSF, some get GCSF, IVIG, and antibiotic prophylaxis, so that was probably the most aggressive. Some the GCSF and IVIG, some only IVIG, some just antibiotics, and some long-term GCSF versus short-term. And so it really varies. Um, and, and part of that reason is because every patient with WIM is going to be a little bit different, um, even within the same family. All right. So I'm sure that there's the some in it um, that have had other treatment strategies here, too. And we'll talk about a couple more here. Um, but one new one um, is Mavericksephor. And so this was just FDA approved in April. Um, I think it was April 30th, actually, so the end of April. Um, and it's an oral pill uh, specifically for WIM. And so it's what is called a CX CX CR4 antagonist. Antagonist meaning it interferes and it kind of stops it from being overactive. So it's adding in a break where I told you that there's no break, you're just stepping on the gas pedal. This adds in that break and helps regulate it is the goal. So what they did, they took 31 patients with WIM, which on the surface does seem small and when we're dealing with rare disease, it's what we're dealing with. This isn't a trial with people with high blood pressure where we can find thousands of people to do. But all of them were greater than 12 years old and they had WIM. And what they showed um, with them, we'll go into a little more detail on the next slide, is that there was, they, did, they had an infection score that they came up with and it decreased by 40%. Um, it didn't reach what we call statistical significance. Um, and so that's just one of the statistics we said. But it did decrease the, the amount of serious infections. And so the, the serious or life threatening one. It increased the neutrophil count above 500 and the um, lymph sites above 1,000. So just the time during the trial where, where you were above those were increased. There's no significant change in warts from baseline, but they did notice that there was um, a decrease in new warts um, that were um, developing. So that, that is important too. There's no change in quality of life um, with that, but with a trial of just 31 people, um, they didn't have what's called the statistical power to be able to detect that um, either. So it wasn't really meant for that. They looked at it, but it wasn't meant to do that. Um, really no adverse effects. Nobody stopped the treatment because of side effects, which is when we're talking about new drugs, that's an important thing. Um, we're a little bit of a few people with thrombocytopenia, that's a little bit lower platelets. None of them are in the range that was dangerous. Um, there's a rash and then also um, there's a warning that it just can't be used in pregnancy um, with this. And so this is from um, their paper that they published um, with all of this. It shows it a little bit, I think, better 
picture than I did on the last slide. And so you can see the people that had um, what, and what did they have? And so this is a good breakdown. Um, 40 to 80% have warts, um, hypogamic albuminemia, immune deficiency, um, everyone pretty much has myelocathexis. And there's not many things that cause myelocathexis. That's pretty specific to women. So what they did, and this is, I think is important to understanding it, is they did what's called a randomized placebo-controlled trial. And this is important um, because what they did is they took 14 patients, gave them the Mavarixipor, and they had 17 patients that they gave a sugar pill. And that's important because then we can compare and we can say the difference is really due to the medications. And then at the end of those 52 weeks or a year, they can say what are the differences between them. And you can see with this picture that the top line here, this is the neutrophils and this is the lymphocytes um, and their increase. And we can see overall, again, those are the big things. We had the decrease in serious infections, the neutrophils and the lymphocytes did increase too. Um, and then they're continuing some long-term studies, too, to say more long-term than a year, um, what's been shown. But because of this study, um, it's now FDA-approved as of now about two months ago. So then um, cure strategies. And so there are a couple other strategies and a couple other treatment options. Um, gene therapy, which I'm sure you hear lots about in the news, lots of excitement, those kind of things. Um, there are some preclinical CRISPR-Cas9 studies that are being investigated. I say preclinical, that means we're testing them in a test tube and they haven't been used in patients yet. And so people are just kind of exploring the idea in WIM, but it's very far from um, ready for prime time or even ready for patients, um, even in an experimental uh, manner. Bone marrow transplant, um, it is curative. If you look at all the literature, there's not a whole lot of patients with WIM who have been treated with bone marrow uh, transplant uh, in there. Part of that is because the risk-benefit ratio, which anything we do, that's the discussion we have to have, may not favor transplant, and it probably doesn't favor transplant in most patients. Um, and, and so you see some of the more severe that people decided to go to transplant because um, they thought the risks of not doing it were higher. But it, it's it's been used, but it's not the, the mainstream treatment by any means, um, but occasionally. And that is it. So now I'm up here for any questions. And yeah, I'm just right on time. So, and then I'll be up here um, afterwards if you want to come up to me too. Either way. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Dr. Hartog. Um, I'm going to just share a couple resources before we get into Perfect. questions. Um, I'm going to oh, yeah, do yeah, the slide yeah. real quick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, if you guys didn't have a question um, after the session that needs to be answered, you can always um, go to our Ask IDF on our uh, main webpage, and you can submit a question, and it can be answered um, by a staff member or even a consulting immunologist. Um, we also have our Get Connected groups, if you would like to get connected with other PI patients um, in our community. And also, please don't forget to complete your session survey on the conference app. Does anybody have a question? We have time for maybe one or two. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm wondering. I heard a lot of people say you're cured. Some doctors say that. What will you do if someone come to you and come as a second opinion and you don't feel that your child or adult is cured? Is cured after after what treatment or? Um, and so, whim would be something that unless um, you've had the, the gene therapy, which isn't available, or a bone marrow transplant it wouldn't be cured because it, 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 it's in your genes. And, and when I say genes, it's the book about you and your book of instructions. So unless somebody, we've changed that book of instructions, bone marrow transplant is, is a way we can do that, um, it wouldn't be cured. Now, some people after a treatment may not need active treatment at a certain point. That, that absolutely may, may be the case, but it wouldn't be cured. And I'd still continue to watch and monitor. It would be, if we've made a diagnosis of whim, Yes, we, there may be times where active treatment may not be needed in certain patients. Thank you. I, I had just a couple of questions I hope I can get in. Um, the, when you said the vaccine for HPV, um, women over 50 um, kind of missed the boat on that. 
I was wondering, or people, really, you're talking about men and women, and um, um, would you recommend that they try to get the vaccine? I do. Um, and so in any of the immune deficiencies that warts are a problem, um, women being one of them, I do rec recommend the HPV in everyone, or the, the vaccine in everyone. Um, and that, that's kind of what is, yeah, somebody in their 50s, it's not on your list of vaccines that are recommended by, by no means. Sometimes you can have a little trouble with insurance approval with that. And, and so that can be one of the things um, that we have to hurdles. We can usually get through that hurdle, but that, that may be one of them. But yes, I, no matter what the recommended vaccine schedule for the average person, I do think that this is one that, that's so low risk and has potential for benefit. Yeah, I'm, uh, in general, working on, on people, people are working on advocacy with their PCPs. But sometimes that's problematic for people over 50 to try to advocate for it, for the vaccine with their PCP. Are there alternative routes for the vaccine? Yes, and so there, I, and I know exactly what you're referring to because we, we do have, because we recommend vaccines in this situation and in other situations that are outside the normal and sometimes primary cures or people will put on the brakes and say, no, this is crazy and I promise you it's not crazy. <laughs> um, and um, so that can, and sometimes it's me getting on the phone with the primary care and that's all they need is just like a, a letter or sometimes saying on the phone and say, nope, I absolutely recommended this. This is where, where you go. So that's one. Um, we carry some of the vaccines because we know that like the pneumovax, our clinics just carries it because uh, because of that. We don't carry the HPV because it's just not that not common enough that I recommend it. Um, but then also in some areas, um, pharmacies, you can, you can get them too. And, and pharmacies ask a lot less questions and um, it's usually more cash pay with pharmacies. So that, that's the, the, the alternative. Um, but yes, pharmacies are often a, a route. Um. We have time for one more. <laughs> again. So my question is, uh, how often do you think people should take the pneumonia vaccine? How, how, how common is it? Like if you diagnose some person and uh, treatment goes well and everything and then you get off and then you come back. Mm -hmm. So for the, the pneumovax, that pneumonia vaccine, typically I'll only do it once in patients, that, um, especially if I have them on IgG replacement therapy, so the IV, the sub-Q, all that. Um, because I'm using it not as a treatment strategy, I'm using it for a diagnosis tool. And so if I use it and I say that somebody, I give it to you, and then I check your blood again and say, you don't respond. Okay, you don't, so getting it more isn't gonna be beneficial. Then what the, the IVIG or the sub-QIG, what that's gonna do, it's going to actually take and give you a response. And so when I say you don't respond, that's, I'm checking the IgG for it. And so if I'm giving you IVIG, all of a sudden I'll fix that problem. And, Yep. Um, not. I, I, I typically will recommend just the normal vaccine schedule. Typically, um, there's there's going to be some exceptions, obviously. Um, so for the pneumovax, the, the recommendation currently is if you have lung disease, it's one time before the age of 65, and so lung disease, even asthma included, and then once after the age of 65 is the current recommendation. Okay, I have one more, Dr. Yes. Clark. Thank you, Doctor. Um, this is more like a generic question as opposed to more specific to this, but um, can you give your opinion on this nutrition, for example? Does it play any role whether to mitigate or exacerbate, you know, whims, cases? You can give your opinion. Not in general, no, it's not going to play a role. And so um, nutrition comes up a lot and um, supplements and those kind of things. And I tell patients I would love if I had a supplement that could help with some of this stuff because it would make my job easier. I don't like my job being harder um, than it needs to be. So fortunately, no, there's not anything. Um, now, nutrition, the, the advice I get when this comes up is just good nutrition, eating healthy. Yes, that's good. Yeah, you know, if we take somebody who's eating healthy versus not, yes, they're gonna, you're going to feel better if you eat. So, like, beyond that, no, um, besides just, yeah, that general. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Hartaw. Everybody give a round of applause.